Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is John Logie, and I work at Nippon Bible College. And here's a new friend I haven't met yet, oh, John, John okay. Logie. Hi. Hi there. Nice to meet you. I am a physician by trade. I did my medical training in Winnipeg and worked in McLennan, Alberta for a number of years. Worked in High Prairie for a number of years. Did some locums in high level. Drove through La Crete once or twice. Checked out your clinic before it was even opened. And uh, so we took the ferry. It was still frozen at the time. No, no it wasn't the ferry. It was the, the ice road across the, uh, the river there. I will probably... No, I don't want to think I'll go back that way because it's, it's too long to get back to High Prairie. But anyway... There you go. My daughter was about six years old, and we moved into a new community. We were staying in the basement of a, an elderly couple's house while our house was getting ready. My daughter went upstairs on Sunday morning and saw the grandmotherly-like lady upstairs getting breakfast ready, and she had curlers in her hair. My daughter had never seen curlers before because that's not something my wife uses. And so at age six, she looked up at grandma and said, what are those things in your hair? And my friend said, well, those are curlers, darling. And my daughter said, well, what are they for? And the lady said, well, they're to make me look beautiful. And my daughter looked up at her and said, it's not working. <laughs> my wife and I have traveled a lot in the last number of years. My job is not as being a pastor, so my speaking engagements are everywhere. And so we have the privilege of being a part of many, many a worship service, both as the speaker and as the, just, just as a, an attendee. We've also moved a fair amount, both sides of the Atlantic Ocean and uh, been in a number of countries, mission works and stuff like that. And one of the things that we've noticed is that, um, I'll, I'll say this politely, preaching is very uneven in Western culture. Some days you walk in and you just say, that was an absolute blessing of a message. You walk out, you shake the minister's hand and whether you've ever even met him before, and you say, wow, it was good to be in the house of the Lord. The other 95% of the time, I'm being honest with you. My standards, yeah, they're, they're maybe a little bit higher than, than everybody that's in the pew because of what I do for a living. But man, we got a lot of work to do in our communication, not just the skills, not just the knowledge, but how we communicate. And so I'm pleased that you chose this topic I'm going to approach it probably a little bit differently than 90% mm, of an instructor that you would uh, bring up here to do. And that is <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2.15 says, and that, oh, by the way, I've got a little booklet here for you. So you don't actually have to write in anything except this booklet. So those of you keeners that brought paper and all that jazz, good for you. You won't need it. Oh, there's one for Second Peter over there. If you go to the inside cover, well, it's the first page actually, there's a verse on the right-hand side there that says, study to show yourself approved by God Workmen who do not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I see three things in that verse, which is kind of the overall theme of what we're going to do here this week. One is to study. If you are going to be a good minister of the gospel, you're going to have to put in some work when you, before you stand up in front of God's people. It's going to take work. You're going to have to get out a book, first of all, your Bible, but you're going to have to use some supplementary stuff. They don't take the place of Scripture. But there are many things about the Scriptures because I don't speak Hebrew. I don't speak Greek. And I never will. So I have to go to some, somebody who has uh, some more knowledge in those types of things 
who has done that study, and I'll tell you a little later on why language study, not to study the original languages themselves, in my opinion, is so important, but to be able to study some of the things that come out of the original language that others have already done the study for us. And fortunately, in our culture, in the English language, we've got a plethora of tools that we can use. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So good preaching starts with uh, one, th- with three things. One is study. Number two, we need to be workmen who are not ashamed, who are approved by God. And that's the first thing we're going to talk about uh, in just a minute. And that is that before you and I step into the pulpit, we need to have godly character. I'm going to be very straightforward with you guys this week because we have a very short amount of time. This is normally a 30-hour course, and we're going to do it in about, what do we got, 14 hours, something like that. And there's no homework assignments other than these little things that we're going to get you to do to apply the stuff. There's no grading, no papers to do, and stuff like that. We need to have good character. We need to live what we're preaching. And I'll get, I'll get more into that in just a little bit. And the f- last piece of the puzzle is, in my opinion, the piece that is so frequently left out of preaching, and that is rightly dividing the word of truth. If you and I are going to communicate truth, we have to know what the truth is and be living it and be able to literally able to understand what we're preaching. Now you just say, well, that only makes sense. But that's one of the pitfalls that we've seen when my little daughter said, it's not working. When I sit in the pew and I listen to some guys preach, I just say, man, it's not working. There's, there's no depth there. One guy had a sermon and he labeled it the 10 most ethical ways to be a good pet owner. Is that a sermon? Is that, is, anyway, you get the idea. I think we got a little bit more responsibility than just that. So let's go into page, the second page there. We've tried throughout the booklet to leave the left side for you to take whatever notes you want. If you flip over to page number three and four, um, they skip the lines on the first one, but you'll notice on the left-hand side in the rest of the booklet, you'll have lines to write there. There are two, I I just need to turn my mic off here. When we talk about preaching, many times what is emphasized is gifting. He has the gift of preaching. He has the gift of teaching, the gift of communicating. Great. That's fantastic. Bill Clinton had the gift of teaching. He had the gift of communicating. He was not a godly man by any stretch, and I certainly wouldn't hire him to be my pastor. But he was a gifted communicator. The content of his communication, we could debate whether or not that was worth listening to, but the guy's a good communicator. There are lots of ungodly good communicators. So what I would suggest is that there is gifting where you see number, line number one there, introduction, gifting, versus, and then the second line is character. I would suggest that before we talk about gifting, we talk about character. Before we emphasize gifting, before we emphasize technique, before we emphasize how to preach, I would suggest that it's good for us to be reminded from Scripture, and if you would go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, of what the characteristics that God has set for all time, all places, what the characteristics of his representatives in the pulpit need to be. First Timothy chapter 3, <clears throat> a person who is a preacher, depending on how your church is structured, in Scripture is called an overseer or a bishop. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have that title or you have that office or that you are a full-time person doing this. But what I learned from this is, let's read it first. Chapter 3, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. Now, we got seven guys here. Oh, we got two more coming. Fantastic. But let's start right at the back there. Each read a verse. Let's just keep everybody awake. Go ahead and read verse 1, 2, 3. Just keep going until we get to verse 7.
Tell me, what does these, this chapter tell us is the character of the man who is going to be the teacher, the overseer, the bishop, the one who has the, mm, the spiritual well-being of a congregation as his responsibility? What are the characteristics, the character of this man? Give me a list. Yep. Mm-hmm. 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 Keep going. Mm-hmm. I'll put the word gentle there. Mm-hmm. Right. What is the Greek word? Anybody know what the Greek word there is? It's important. I, I don't talk a lot about original languages, and I'm an expert in neither of the biblical languages. But this one's important. The word, mm, does your Bible have new convert there? Some translations have new convert. The word is literally new plant, neophyte. The Greek word is neophyte, new plant. And what do you think that means? Why is that in there? Yes, tell me more. That's the metaphor. What does it mean? It's not well rooted. It's, um, it's tender. It can easily be destroyed by Yes. So what's the word that, who, who answered the question? What is the actual word in, in your Bible? Young convert. A young convert or a new convert. That's correct. I am very pleased with the exception, perhaps, I don't know how old you are, but I'm going to guess you're late 30s, somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. I'm very pleased that you don't have any 18-year-olds here tonight. To be able to stand before the people and say, this is what the Lord God says, and you need to follow not just what it says, but I'm living what this says. You got to have some dirt under your fingernails. You got to have some water under the bridge. And so what Paul, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is telling Timothy is that you and I that are going to speak, we got to have some miles behind us before we stand in the pulpit. Now, just a little caution, and I don't know the church background here, and so I can say stuff like this and get away with it because you know I'm not aiming at anybody. Don't put somebody in your pulpit who's a new convert. Just don't do it. In our culture, it happens over and over and over and over again. It just happened very recently where some celebrity comes to know the Lord, makes a profession of faith, and the first thing people do, because he's been a celebrity in the secular world, is they take him and they plop him in front of the camera and a whole whack of people in church and say, now, this guy is a Christian. Now, everybody else should be a Christian too. And the guy can't handle the mantle of being a preacher in front of everyone. That's not what he's, he's not ready for that. He's a neophyte. He's a new plant. Let the guy grow, develop some roots and a nice solid trunk. Or when the wind blows, his plant's going to fall over. That's the metaphor. Anyway, forgive me for elaborating on that, but that's very important. He's not a new convert. What else? Finish out the list. We're missing one biggie here. Okay. Not a wine bibber. How's that for KJV? Not greedy. Not proud. Keep going. Good. Uh, we'll put it on there. If it's not there, that's a good one. Good. That doesn't mean <clears throat> that, no, that everybody outside the church loves the guy. How many people outside the church tried to kill Paul? It means you have a good reputation. The reason they wanted to kill him was for, were for, was for godly reasons. So if somebody wants to burn your house down because you're preaching the gospel, that's a good reputation. Okay? So not a... Uh, uh, oh, that was a new con not a new convert here. Good reputation with outsiders. There's one biggie, dun, 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 dun. we're missing one. There's one major qualification we're missing. It takes up about two verses. Thank you. He's got 
He manages family well. Does your family promote the gospel or is your family a distraction from the gospel? I'm not going to get any details about that. I'm not laying down any church laws here. You guys have to know how to apply that. But if your family is a distraction, your, your ministry is going to be compromised. That's what that means. Now, that's all character stuff. Now, I got a question for you. What is the one gifting on the list? He has to be able to teach. That is the message of that passage. To God, what is more important? Your ability to teach or our character? Quite frankly, you can be a lousy communicator with words. But if your life looks like this, people will listen to you. If your life looks like this, you have authority. You can, you can gain an ability to teach. You can, you can take classes. You can increase your ability over time. You can, be, you can learn from people that have gone before you. All of that's true. But this needs to happen before that gets exercised. Which is one of the reasons why <laughs> you can't be a new convert. You haven't had time to do all this stuff. You haven't had time to develop that kind of rock-solid character. There's only one, this is 1B, there's only one ability or gifting qualification of an elder. Now here is question, this is the question in C, 1C on page 2. <clears throat> if you were to do an internet search of the pastor openings in Alberta, what does the job description of a typical pastoral opening look like? Does it look like that? Just for fun, do, do an internet search when, you, when you're bored. <laughs> And look for a pastor job opening and look at the job description, the type of person that the church is looking for. It is a rare church that looks like that. My encouragement to us that are <clears throat> budding ministers, if you will, and I don't know all of you individually, I'd like to get to know you over the next week. I don't know what your positions are. Some of you may be farmers, businessmen, whatever. What makes you a good communicator, number one, is having a life that will back up what you say. If you can bring that to the pulpit, people will listen to your character and your words have weight. We can work on the skill stuff. We'll, we'll help with that. That'll come in time. Questions about that? Comments? Things you want to add? I grew up in a conference of churches when I was that typically had a constitution that said we have to have four deacons or we have to have four of this or we have to have three of that and you finally twisted enough arms to fill that position in a smaller church until you had everybody that had to have so and so many people on the board same same idea are they qualified are they actually called and qualified that's the first question any other comments? Who knows what a meta-narrative is? Number two there on, on that uh, second page. What's a meta-narrative? <laughs> That's why you're here, brother. <laughs> narrative. Okay, tell me what a narrative is. What's a synonym? Another word that we could put in its place. Story. A story. Right. So whenever you hear the word narrative, that's just a literary term for a story. Meta-narrative. What's that? Yeah. 
Well, I'll give you a clue. Mm, -dum -dum. Uh, a there has a question under meta narrative. A, how many stories are in the Bible? Anybody know? Take a guess. How many? Give me a number. 600? Any other guesses? And this is, you know, smarties in a jar. Whoever guesses the right number gets the jar. Stories, yeah. I think you had the right answer in the back of your head. What's the, what's the right answer, Peter? One. <laughs> There's one story. The meta narrative is the overarching story of the Bible. When you open your Bible, in the beginning, God created. When you open, when you close the Bible, there is a new creation. When you open the Bible, there is perfection. When you close the Bible, there is perfection. When you open the Bible, there is a ruining of perfection. When you close the Bible, there is a restoration of perfection. When you open the Bible, there is let us make man in our own image. The first suggestion of Trinitarian doctrine. When you close the Bible, you see all three members of the Godhead in full blossom working together. When you open the Bible, you hear God say to the serpent, one day there will come a man who will bruise your head. When you close the Bible, you see in Revelation chapter 1, the glorified, risen, resurrected Jesus Christ who is flashing a sword, whose hair is, his head is, has hair like wool, who has feet like burnished bronze. He was coming out of his mouth as a double-edged sword. You know that picture from Revelation chapter 1? That's Genesis 3.15 in full fulfillment. It's all one story. Everything from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 is a single story. It's the story of lost, redeemed, eternally destined man under the umbrella and guise, mm, direction is a much better word, of Almighty God. There's one story. So when you and I look at Moses, we have to think, how does he fit into the meta-narrative? <clears throat> Moses is not an island. When you and I see Noah, when you and I see Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and all the pieces of the puzzle, we have to think about how that piece of the puzzle fits into the greater part of Scripture, which is why you can teach the gospel with Isaac on the altar. Remember that story? You can teach the gospel right there to a, somebody who's seven years old. That's the idea of the whole story fitting together. Here's the encouragement. When you and I are talking about the different kinds of things to preach, the different kinds of literature that, is, that are embedded in Scripture, and how to approach preaching each of the different kinds, think, oh, it doesn't matter which genre, that's another vocabulary word that I'll use over and over again, The word genre simply means the kind of literature. So in literature, um, uh, we have um, narrative, story, poetry, parable, epistle, apocalyptic. We're going to talk about six or seven different kinds of literature. So each of those kinds of literature in literature is called a genre. So if I throw that word out, that's, that's all that means. It's, it's just a, not meant to be a distraction. So think about how, when you're preaching any part of Scripture, but especially the narratives, especially the story parts of Scripture, Daniel and the lion's den, how does that fit into the overarching story? Always think in your head and always communicate in the message how your story, that is the story you're preaching on, fits into the greater story. It is not an island. 
it's part of a great big story because there's only one story. Now, here's what I want us to do is to take five minutes. I do not have a watch, but it looks like we have 7, is it 729? Is that what I'm seeing up there? Okay. I want you to take five minutes. I'll get it six minutes. So it'll be 735. I want you to pair up, just the two of you. Find a pair. Find a partner. We've got two, four, six, eight, ten. Perfect. Find somebody to pair up with. And what I want you to do, and I don't care if you do this in English or in Plotdich. Doesn't matter. I want you to tell your partner the overarching story of the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation. Each of you gets two minutes. Go. Right where you are.
Here's challenge number one for the night. I would suggest that it is very helpful for us to be able to communicate that in about two minutes. Did you notice how hard that was? It's, it's not easy, is it? I would suggest that it's actually a good exercise. It's not part of what we're going to do here this week other than what we just did. But I would suggest that you go home and in order to be able to emblazon that, to burn that into your consciousness and be a, a person who is able to see how my text fits into the greater overarching meta-narrative of the Bible, know that meta-narrative well. Get out your Bible, get out a piece of paper and write out the whole story. And then actually practice a couple of times being able to go from Genesis 1-1 to Revelation 22, whatever the last verse is, I don't know the number there, and be able to tell that story in a very short period of time. It's a really good skill to have and shows us how, uh, us how our text fits into the larger meta-narrative. How many stories are in the Bible? One, explain the concept of meta-narrative. We've talked about that overarching story. All right, we've talked about that. <clears throat> when we talk about homiletics, there is, it is hard to overemphasize the concept of context. Everything, every piece of literature, every conversation that we have has a context. I was just talking to somebody uh, a couple of days ago. I said to them, Jesus said two very interesting things. He said, my peace I give you, my peace I leave with you. And in another context, he said, I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. And you sit there, if you're not a biblical, uh, biblically literate person, you look, and did the same person say both of those things? Actually, yeah, he did. Well, what does that mean? Paul, Romans 3.20 said, No man shall be justified by the works of the law. It is by grace and grace alone. And he hit that, <coughs> he hit that rock many, many, many times, didn't he? The whole book of Galatians is one great big, don't you dare depend on your works. And then you get to the book of James. And you hear James say, Without faith, sorry, without works, your faith is dead. And don't tell me that you can be redeemed without works. And you just, it's almost like you get doctrinal whiplash when you go back and forth between James and Paul. Uh, how is that possible? The answer is context. If you look at what James was teaching at that time, he was talking about how works fit into a person who is already saved. He's not talking about being justified by works themselves. He was saying that justification is evidenced by works. Romans, it's, it's, if you go elsewhere in the same book in Romans, Paul said almost identically the same thing that James did. But nobody ever preaches from that verse. So everything is about context. Every single piece of Scripture has a context. I got a card, a very nice greeting card once. I don't know if it was a thank you card or a birthday card. It doesn't really matter. But it was one of those, you know, Hallmark dudes from the, from the, uh, from the Christian bookstore. And inside the card that I got, it said this. It had this verse, Psalm 129, verse 8. And it said, the blessing of Yahweh be upon you. We bless you in the name of Yahweh. Isn't that great? Wasn't that a nice thing to write? That's exactly what it says. I'd like you to actually open your Bibles to Psalm 129 and look at verse 8. Psalm 129, verse 8. Somebody read that for us, please. What, 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 what was that first part? Neither let those who pass by them say. Yeah. What is it? another translation? 
Anybody else have a different translation? <laughs> it's a fine. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just not the kind of uh, wording that we use in, in 2022. It's correct. This is what this translation says. May those who pass by not say, may those who, uh, sorry, may those who pass by not say the blessing of Yahweh be upon you. That's what the text actually says. So what, what the guy did when he wrote this card, and I'm not criticizing, I don't even know who it was, and I'm not, I'm not complaining about the individual. I'm complaining about how they're misusing Scripture. They yanked that blessing out of a context in which it actually said, don't say this. <laughs> you can't do that. If we're going to rightly divide the word of truth, we have to use every single text the way the text was intended to be used. The text in that particular card was used in the exact opposite manner that it was designed for. That's bad homiletics. Don't do that. Okay, enough about that. So context, context, I tell the students at Nippon Bible College, context is king. So the first work that you and I need to do is work of character. The second work that I would suggest that you and I need to do in an overarching setting is to know the meta narrative and how our text fits into the meta narrative. The third piece that you and I must do as good speakers is to know the context of the text that God has asked us to speak from. Know the context. The person who put that in the card did not understand the context. All right. Any questions about context? We're going to talk more about that throughout the week, but I, I just wanted to introduce the concept. I'm going to talk briefly about some, uh, what's the word that was used here? Resources. Yeah, that's a good word. I would suggest that every person who is going to step into the pulpit have three resources. Number one has a couple of different parts to it, and that is you should have a study Bible. You really should have a study Bible. A good study Bible has a couple of things. One is a column of cross-references in it. It shows you where that concept or, or quote comes from. Um, <clears throat> I'll just show you what mine looks like. I'm, I, I don't sell books in, in the sense of making um, this a living of mine. But in my study Bible, it has in the middle here a bunch of cross-references to show me if the word redemption is in the verse, it'll have a little letter behind it. You go into the here and see. It gives you three or four different verses that are important in knowing where the word redemption is used elsewhere. And then a second thing <clears throat> in the bottom here, it will have a little mini commentary. The third thing that's here, and I'll see if I can find a quick example of this. It has uh, introduction to books and outlines and stuff like that. And I use those occasionally, but what I really like, I think it's in the book of Luke in this one. It'll have tables. Here it is. This is one I've used more than once. It'll have tables listing, for example, all the parables of Jesus. And it's sitting right in your Bible. So I carry this baby around. You can see it's a little bit tattered, but you get to know that particular chunk of paper well and put all your notes and write and highlight or whatever in there. It's actually a very valuable piece. It's a valuable tool. And if you forget all the other tools, in my opinion, having a good study Bible that you can mark up, having those three components. <clears throat> a concordance is cool too, but that's another, another thing I'm going to talk to you about. Um, Cross-references, a little tiny commentary at the bottom, and then the third thing are those tables. You choose whatever version you want. I'm not a version pusher at all. Um, I think the version that we need to use is the one that we understand. It has to be accurate, and we have to understand it. And if it's in English, great. If it's in, there's not too many Bibles in Low German. There is a Low German Bible, but anyway. Do you pre, is this, the service is in English, right? Yeah. Okay, I just heard you guys speaking Low German there, and in, uh, I got hungry for some form of Warsh there, but... <laughs> So, 
Anyway, we'll talk about Raul Kukin and Ravuz after the service tonight. The second. Okay, John, what was that third point that you had? Raul Kukin. <laughs> 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 context. context. Right. One is character, two is meta narrative, three is context. And they're all in this little book here. Oh. Oh, it had three pieces in it? The tables. It has a bunch of tables or lists in them. Yep. In my opinion, and we make all of our freshmen buy one of these things, is everybody that is going to preach from the Word of God, in my opinion, needs to have a Bible dictionary. It looks like a doorstop, and these things are heavy. But I'll tell you, there is nothing more helpful for somebody who is... Um, if you're not going to spend a ton of time in a Bible school per se, um, and I spend a lot of time in Bible school, and I still use this thing all the time. I'm going to give you an example. Who's Herod? Exactly. Now, if you and I are sitting in 30 AD, and somebody says Herod, which Herod are we talking about? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're sitting and somebody's speaking about Herod, they would know exactly which Herod you were talking about, right? But that is not the same Herod that was there when Jesus was born. That's a different Herod. And then you get into the book of Acts and they start talking about Herod and it's Herod part three. And later in the book of Acts, you get Herod part four. Well, which Herod are we talking about? So in the context, the people that are living at that time know exactly which Herod it is. Herod 1, Herod 2, Herod, they knew all of them. I didn't know that until I got a Bible dictionary. And I looked up Herod, and it has a list of all four of them. It tells you exactly who they are, who their parents were, how they related. And you know what? I don't need to know all that detail. If you want to know all that stuff, there, there are other resources. But it'll give you a synopsis of who the Herods are. And it helps us keep them apart and learn about who the Pharisees were, their characteristics. Why did they become friends with the Herodians? That made no sense whatsoever. That's what this book is for. Now, the, I did bring some of these with me so that you, if you want to take them home, it'll make your assignments easier. And if you want, um, I've, got some, I've got three of these if you want to come and talk to me afterwards. Number two, I still believe in paper concordances. <clears throat> this, you've seen as Strong's. I know people here are using King James. This is good old-fashioned Strong's, and there's no substitute for it. This is the best doorstop you'll ever have. It, it, is a, it has every single word of the Bible, every reference that it's used. So if you want to look up the word promise, look up the word promise. It'll have every single time in Scripture that the word promise is used. They did the same thing with the NIV. I don't know if anybody uses the NIV. This is what's called a complete concordance. An exhaustive concordance has all the a, an, the, but, they, he, she, has them all. Well, whoever uses that, but the dude that made this thing up put them all in there. So an exhaustive concordance has every single listing of every single word in the entire Bible. That's why the thing is huge. This thing is what's called a complete concordance. They leave all those little guys out there, the ones that you never use. It'll have promise in there, and a complete concordance has every single listing of every word that is in here. So all of, the, all of the useful words in a concordance are in a complete concordance. This is really, if you want um, the mini version of this one, it's the useful words, and skip all the other ones. So that, that's, this one's indexed to the NIV. This is good old-fashioned Strong's. And there's really no substitute for having a good paper concordance, in my opinion. Number three, I'll use this one, I got a couple of these, is if you're serious about Bible study, preparing for sermons, if you're going to do this on a regular basis or even a semi-regular basis, get yourself a good commentary. If you've got a little bit of extra money, you can write this down. The set that I would suggest, I went out and bought this thing because it is the best commentary series, in my opinion, in English. It's called the Expositors 
Bible commentary. I'll write it down. The Expositor's Bible Commentary. It's 13 volumes. So you can imagine 13 doorstops. Um, it will cost you somewhere between $600 and $650. The cool thing is you buy one, you'll never have to buy another commentary. They're that good. They get scholars from all over the world, the best people in the book of James, the best people in the book of Genesis. They put all the best people together. They got them all in the same room, told them, you go do your thing and bring them back. And they edited it. And in my opinion, it's the best single set of commentaries in English for our level of, of uh, scholarship. There are other ones that go way into the original languages. That's not my kind of... If you want a mini version of the $650 dude, that's this boy. This is the shortened, it was the, they put the 13 volume one through the dryer and came out with this guy. So if you're interested, I brought two of these with me that you can take home with you. I do believe if you're gonna do any kind of regular sermon delivery that you should have a commentary series. The last but not least, Everybody has their favorite translation, and I'm not going to try and get you to convert to my favorite translation, because I don't push translations with one exception, and that is a translation that I never preach from. And I'll get to that in just a second. There are multiple different translations, and am I, am I safe to talk translations in this setting? I want to be, res okay, I just want to be respectful because... <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> when I grew up in Awana clubs, back then, Awana, do you have Awana in town here someplace? Kids club? It's a Bible memory, um, discipleship type thing. When I grew up, I memorized all my scriptures in the King James, so I'm not an anti-King James guy. The challenge with King James it, it's, is that people don't think in terms of bowels of mercy anymore. So to, you got you to gotta translate the translation first to a five-year-old, just if, you're, if you want to take the time to do that, fantastic. The cool thing about the King James is that it uses English in a manner that none of the other translations can do. It just sounds nice. There's, there's an appreciation for the language of English, but it's hard to read, especially if you're nine. It's hard to memorize because the words... Uh, anyway, the cool thing, the other cool thing about the King James is that it's almost, it's one of the best literal translations. There are two other literal translations. One is the New American Standard. And my point in bringing this up is if you and I are going to teach or preach on a regular basis, get about five different translations that you like. And I would suggest getting a couple of literal ones, one that's a little bit less literal, and I'll get to that in a minute, and then one that is um, almost like a, a running commentary, and I'll make a couple of suggestions, and you choose whichever ones you want. The best ones in more modern English are the ESV and the New American Standard. The New American Standard is a little bit clunky. It's a little bit hard to read from the pulpit, but it is very literal. The ESV is, a, is in my opinion, probably the best combination between readability in public understandability in 2022. The ESV is a very good literal translation. If you don't have a New American Standard or an ESV, I would suggest that you get one of those, if not both, because they're complementary translations. For those of us who do not know the original language as well, and I can't go to my Greek New Testament, I do that for other reasons, but I can't read Greek or Hebrew, but I can read English. And so what I do in preparation for sermons is I read that text in about five different translations. And then I get a much wider understanding of what that text means. So I like using multiple translations with an emphasis on the more literal ones. King James, New American Standard, ESV. In the middle <clears throat> is good old NIV. The new NIV is a 2011 They've put the more politically correct 
uh, non-gender terms in there. And I don't like the, the 2011 as much as the 1984. So if you can get your hands on a 1984 NIV, in my opinion, that's a better translation, more useful. And it's very nice for somebody who is um, new to um, either English or new to the Lord, doesn't have all the background that perhaps you and I do in church. It's, it's much easier to understand. But um, it's, it's not as literal. It just isn't but it's, it's kind of in the middle. Same genre. Oh, that's a King James. Um, there's a new one out. It's called the Christian Standard Bible. You can have a look at this one. I've got a copy with, and by the way, if you want to take any of these home, I've put some, some prices in the front, and you'll be surprised and ple pleasantly surprised. Like this one, this is a Christian Standard Bible. It's $10. So I brought some stuff, all this stuff that I brought with me, is stuff that you guys are welcome to, uh, to, uh, to purchase and take home with you if you want. So the one that is much less literal, it's a, a newer translation, and I wouldn't preach from this a whole lot. Some guys are doing it and using it their primary text in church, and I'm a little bit hesitant to do that. <clears throat> but the usefulness of it, it's called the New, Liter uh, the New Living Translation, or the NLT. The thing about the NLT is that it's almost like a running commentary on the text. And that's the reason I like it and also the reason I don't like it. And the reason I don't use this from the pulpit, except rarely for, for specific reasons, is because it's not really a translation. It's more of a paraphrase. And the guys that translated this were a little bit too loose, uh, a little too often for me to use it from the pulpit. However... If you want something that almost acts like a commentary when you're reading through the text, you say, what on earth does that mean in Romans chapter 12? You whip out this thing and you read it and you think, oh, okay, that's what that means. It's almost like a commentary in your back pocket. So that's the New Living Translation. Just be aware that it, it, it's, almost, it's almost a paraphrase. And you have to be careful because it's not actually the words of the text very frequently being translated. It's more interpretive. So if I can summarize, good old King James, ESV, NASB, in the middle, NIV, Holman or Christian Standard Bible. The Holman is the old one. Um, used that one a lot when I was in seminary. And then way over here, almost on the uh, paraphrase side, is the NLT. I would suggest having a couple of these, one of these, and maybe this one if you want. So, any questions about translations? Okay. Now, I'm going to diverge just a little bit from my <clears throat> I don't recommend translation thing, with one exception, and that is, if you are going to teach and preach on a regular basis, get a Young's Literal Translation. You won't read it from the pulpit. You'll never hear me reading from the pulpit. It is the hardest thing to read from the pulpit. It's even harder than King James because it's still got a lot of the these and the thous. And the word order is goofy. They haven't smoothed it out. But the cool thing about the Young's Literal is that it takes the original word in whatever the original language is and puts it directly into English, regardless of the context. Let me tell you why that's important. For study purposes. I don't understand the original languages with a few exceptions of, uh, of some words that have stuck in my head. Kind of like the food words in, uh, in Low German. They're the ones that stuck. Formavorsch, Zamaborsch. You know, you gotta, you gotta know the important words in, in any language. But anyway, so when this guy translated this back in, I don't know, late 19th century, he took the original word and put it into English the same way every time. So, when you go through, for example, the book of Joshua, when they went through the Jordan River, remember that? At flood stage, they went through the Jordan River. What was it that they put a pile of on the other side of the Jordan to commemorate that? Stones. When they killed Achan, what did they use? Stones. When they made a memorial at the end of the book, when they were, when uh, Gad, 
and uh, the half-tribe of Manasseh, Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh were going back across. What did they do before they went back as a memorial there? Another pile of stones. Now, in between, there's this story of Joshua saying, God, stop the sun. Remember that story? We've all heard that story. Stop the sun. And God stopped the sun. But that was only half the miracle. Do you remember the other half of the miracle? It says more people, more enemy soldiers, more pagan sinful people that God was judging died from what? Stones. That's what the text says. Our English translators have put the word hail in there. But that's not what the original Hebrew says. It says stones. Here's why that's important. When you and I are reading through in English, we have these interpretive things, great. But when you're reading it in the original language, it's not just isolated story here, story here, story here. Do you see how the author of Joshua, ultimately the Holy Spirit, is tying together the first story with the last story? If you follow the book of Joshua from chapter 1 to chapter 24, the entire conquest and occupation of the new land was a story of piles of stones. You don't get that in English the same way, but this guy gets it. So I have a Young's Literal Translation beside my study spot at home, and when I go to study a new book for the first time, for example, if I haven't preached through the book of James before, one of the things I do is that I get out my, 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 <clears throat> my Young's Literal, and I read through the book of James in the Young's Literal. And then I read it again, and I take out, this is, this is what I do, I'm not telling you you have to do this, but I'm telling you the utility of this. How is the author, ultimately the Holy Spirit, in this particular case, the, 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 the Apostle James, how is he trying to communicate? Because remember, this is literature. It's not just what he's communicating, it's how he's communicating it, which helps us to communicate what he's communicating. So when I get to the book of James, I read it through once, and then I say, oh, wait a minute. There are about half a dozen words that he keeps repeating over and over again. You don't pick that up in English, but you pick it up in the Young's Literal Translation. So I get out a a set of markers and a set of colored pens, and I start saying all the words that pertain to love. When I did 1 John, there's a lot of words in the the book of 1 John talking about love and hate, right? Circle them all in red. That was a pretty easy one to find out. Then it talks about life, circled all those in green. And by the time I get done, I think, oh, oh man, I found another five words that he keeps repeating. And I go through it a third time. And by the time I get done, if I were to have brought, I should have brought it with me. My Young's Literal at home has got colors all over the place. And when I get to chapter one, I say, oh, that's interesting. I circled that word. Where else is that word used in this book? And I see how that theme progresses through the whole of the book. And it enables me to teach the whole book, much, each section of the book, in light of the whole book, in a much more cohesive and not just educated, but in a much better way of communicating it to the people who are going to be on the other side of the pulpit. So I, I really like this. I recommend that all of our students buy one. And... Um, I brought five of them with me, so you could too if you wanted to. <laughs> but um, that's, uh, that's another tool. Any questions about the tools? Those are the resources. I could talk about 50 other ones. Those are the ones I think for those of us who are mm, not necessarily going to be seminary professors, these are the ones I would recommend. You'd be surprised. No, you wouldn't be. You're, you're, you've got too much gray hair to be surprised by this. 
at how much better you actually remember something when you flip through it with your hands and your fingers and your pen and your highlighter and stuff like that. When you take the time to do that, it just sinks into your memory better. Those, I use Bible Gateway as a quick concordance when I'm at work, when I've got internet access. The cool thing about books, you don't need the internet. <laughs> and when the internet goes down, I still got all my books. Anyway, but certainly there are online tools. Shoot, we could talk all day about all the online tools that are available. But, but it really is cool. You look at that, it's such a large program, I don't need it. Sure. If you want to talk about this, I'm done talking about resources, unless we allude to them later sometime. I will leave all of these up here if you wish. I think, brother, you said we we're going to break for coffee. This is the time to do that. Yep.
It's Darren, right? All right. I can hear we're back in business here. So greetings to those of you that are in Grand Prairie. I'll just wave at you. I can shake your hand sometime when I'm in Grand Prairie. I lived in Peace Country, Alberta for a number of years, and uh, I won't play the Mennonite game of do you know. <laughs> but it's still fun. Yes, we won't take the time to do it here, that's all. It is fun. Um, <clears throat> when the children of Israel conquered the promised land under Joshua, he left them with a, an exiting charge saying, don't worship the gods of the Amorites that you just drove out. If you do, God is going to punish you and start taking away your land. It didn't take two generations, and that's exactly what happened. Was the, remember the book of Judges? So in the book of Judges, we have them falling away. As soon as the, na- the, the generation of Joshua died out, they started to fall away. And God did sell them into the hands of the surrounding nations. And when they were oppressed by these nations, they would cry out to the Lord, and the Lord would send a deliverer. We call them judges, but they're not judges in the sense of all rise, your honor, his whatever. That's not the kind of judge they were. So if you think of a guy like Gideon, he wasn't sitting there with a gavel and a fancy wig and, you know, and robes in court. The guy was a warrior. They were deliverers. That's really what the word judge meant at that time. At one particular time, the nation of Israel was being oppressed because of their wickedness by a people that we know as the Midianites. They were kind of cousins to the Israelites through Lot and his descendants, but they were the enemies of God's people at the time. And for years, I think it's 18, they were under the thumb of these Midianites. They had to pay high taxes, tribute, and send it off. Well, the one year, they were sending off the tribute with a guy by the name of Ehud. Ehud was a guy that was carrying the booty, if you will, the loot, over to the king of the Moabites. His name was Eglon. Eglon had quite the um, Big Mac um, um, stock in front of him. In other words, the Bible calls him very fat. When Ehud got uh, into the biblical story, he's the guy carrying the tribute to Eglon, and he leaves the tribute at the feet of Eglon, and the Bible tells us that Ehud was a Benjamite. Does anybody know what the word Benjamin means? It means son of my right hand. So when Jacob named his youngest son, he said, I still got it. That's the son of my right hand. That was the strong hand. Even if you go to the Middle East today, people who, I've got a friend from Lebanon, and he said nobody in the Middle East is left-handed. They're all right-handed. To be left-handed is kind of, you're an outcast. Everybody's right-handed. Not the Benjamites. Not the Benjamites. They were trained to be warriors from this big. And you know how they did it? The actual Hebrew phrase does not say that he was left-handed, but that's what your Bible will say because they've, tr- they've translated it and interpreted it at the same time. The actual, and if you've got one of these babies, while we're telling the story, you look up Judges chapter 3 and tell me what it says when you get to Ehud. Judges chapter 3. I won't give you that. So we got the son of the right hand who is walking through the door and your English text says that he was a left-handed man. Now, why is that important? Well, when you go through the security guards in 1200, 1300 BC, you have to show them that you don't have a sword. So what do I do? I walk through the door and the security guard said, dude, show me your cloak. So he'll open his cloak Because where do you hide your sword? Uh -uh. Uh-uh. On the opposite side. side. It's much quicker to go... Can you imagine what it would be like to go... You're dead by that time. So what you do is you... 
and you've got your sword in your hand. So anybody that's right-handed, which is everybody in the culture, especially the son of the right hand, has their sword on the left side. So you open the left side of your cloak, no sword, okay, you, you, you pass security. What does it say? Uh, okay, what, the, what verse? I don't know, I'd have to, it's chapter 3. Well, you got it, you got it. Where does it say he's left-handed? Here we go, here we go. Aha, there we go. Verse 15. So don't read verse 15 yet. I want these guys to read it out of the English Bible. Somebody read verse 15, Judges 3.15. The son of my right hand. And in parentheses, the son of the right hand is left-handed. That is not what the Hebrew says. Peter, what does the Young's literal tell us? Okay. And the sons of Israel uh, served Eglon, king of Moab. Moab, sorry, not Midian. And the sons of Israel cry unto Jehovah. Uh, Keep going. Unto Jehovah, and Jehovah raised uh, to them a savior, Ehud, uh-huh. son of Gera, uh-huh. a Benjamite. Son of my right hand. Think about your, you're telling your five-year-old son this story for the first time. And Ehud, he sends him Ehud, the son of my right hand. Keep going. Keep reading, Grandpa. Keep reading. A man He's shut in his right hand. The other way of translating it, that is, he's got his right hand tied up. The way you teach somebody who's right-handed to use their left hand is by making their right hand immobile. They can't use it. So what the Benjamite parents did in order to teach their children to be ambidextrous warriors was they would take all of their kids who would naturally be right-handed and they would literally tie their right hand down. And so the kid from two years old would learn how to sling a sling, how to fight with sticks and eventually swords with their left hand. So this dude walks into the king Eglon, pays the tribute. He opens his cloak at the security guard and said, nothing there, guys closes his cloak, and he says, Mr. Eglon, sir, I have a message from God for you. Eglon gets all serious, kicks all of his courtiers out of the room, locks the door. Ehud comes back, son of the right hand, with his right hand tied, meaning he knew how to use his left hand, walks up to Tubby, takes the sword out of his right thigh and plunges it all the way through so that the tip of his sword is sticking out the back of his back. Now keep reading, brother. Um, uh, don't, don't, I, I gotta skip, we got to skip down a little bit just for the sake of time. All right, so verse 17 says that Eglon is very fat. When he finished, I have a secret word for you, verse 19. Um, dum, verse 20, he says it again. Now, verse 21. Um, and he who put it forth his left hand and taketh the sword from off his right thigh and striketh it into his belly, and the heft also goeth in after the blade. And the fat shutteth on, shutteth on the blade that he hath not drawn the sword out of his belly, and it goeth out at the fundament. Right. Now that's why you don't read it on Sunday morning. It's very difficult. You actually did pretty well. Good job. You say what just happened? Now the other way to translate that last verse is that his guts were laying out all over the floor. Now, I don't know what your translation says, but it, that's gory. That is an ugly bedtime story. So tell your grandkids that story 
you know, early in the day so that they can run it off a little while. But you get the idea. And, and, and the five-year-old boy, Hebrew boy, hearing this story for the first time, his eyes are about the size of saucers. And, and then what happened, Grandpa? It says that the door was locked. Ehud ran out the back window. And while they were waiting for King Eglon to come out the door, Ehud is running toward Israel to muster all of the troops to come back. And they end up beating the people, the beating the Moabites. Now, you're a servant that got kicked out of the room, and you're literally going, what's going on in there? How come he's taking so long? And they try the door, and the door is locked. They say, all right, we'll, we'll give him a little bit more time. Meanwhile, Ehud is beelining it back to Israel to get all of his buddies and their swords and come back and fight. But they don't know that. And all of a sudden, <laughs> It stinks out in the porch where all the guys are waiting for Eglon. It really, remember intestines all over the floor? You ever gut shot a deer or something like that? The first deer I ever shot, I hit it right in the guts. That is not pretty. What? Yeah, yeah. It was dead, but it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. It was my first one, so it was okay. <laughs> but you know what that smell is like. Now, the next, part of the, the next part of the book, I'll, I'll take the pain away from you. Ehud went out the porch, verse 23, verse 24. When he went out, the servants came in, and lo, <clears throat> um, the doors of the chamber are bolted, and these courtiers said, end of verse 24, what does your English translation say? Ah, what translation is that? <laughs> Good. That is exactly what the Hebrew says. He's covering his feet. And if you were to read that on Sunday morning and to a five-year-old today in English or in Low German, they would say, Grandpa, what on earth does that mean? But if you were a little Hebrew boy... And I'll, I'll demonstrate. And you go to the outhouse and sit down on that wooden plank. The first thing you do is drop your drawers. And where do your drawers go? They cover your feet. So the idiom, that is the way of saying things in Hebrew, when he's sitting on the pot is, he's covering his feet. That's exactly what the text says. So while these guys are sitting outside the door... <laughs> What do they say? Oh, he's covering his feet, which is a nice way of saying he's sitting on the toilet doing number two. That's what we would say. Now, if you were to say that in Greek, number two, what on earth is number two? Yeah, exactly. Anyway, you get the idea. That's, a, that's an English idiom. But the Hebrew idiom is he's covering his feet. And so they sit there and they wait a little bit longer. You get the idea. Delay, 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 delay. That's what gave Ehud the time to go get the armies and come back when they weren't ready. When they finally waited long enough, they opened the doors and they found Eglon is dead. And there's no Ehud there. Now, one more little thing that we don't get in English either, and that is, do you know what the word Eglon means? What does his name mean? Do you remember? It means calf. Can you put the pieces of the puzzle together? You walk in, and Ehud just slaughtered the fattened calf. God allowed that sacrifice, if you will, to be made to save his people. That's the story of Ehud. Three things. Number one, know the story well. When you preach Old Testament narrative, know the story well. Now, I made a little bit of boo-boo there in that I got the wrong group of people. <laughs> My apologies. But I'm not, I'm only using this as an illustration. I know that story well 
from studying it and telling it so many times, I don't need a text anymore. In my opinion, that's how well you should know your text when you mount the pulpit. When you read it in five different translations and you let that text percolate in your mind, have some notes there because we all get a little bit nervous, especially the first few times we preach. Having your notes in front of you is good, but you shouldn't read and preach from notes. You should read and preach from what God has emblazoned on your heart, the message that he's given to you. You should know that so well that you only reference your notes, you don't read them. Reading a sermon, you read a speech, not a sermon. Number two, that's the importance of context work. When you do context work, Old Testament narrative, Old Testament story tells itself. How much time did I spend on application when I preached that mini-sermon, if you will? About that long. Did I have to have five or ten minutes of application for you to understand what the story was meaning and applying to our lives? No. It's because the biblical text is there and it speaks for itself. It is the sermon. One of the biggest errors that preachers make, old, young preachers, is that their sermon is the focal point of the message, not the text. The text has to be the focal point. How much time did my little sermon there focus on the text. The whole thing. The story told itself. Now, a little bit of context work behind the story to what does the word eglon mean, the, the shutting of the right hand, the context, you know, the, the, the what do you call it, uh, the cultural thing of opening the cloak and, you know, taking out the sword, explaining all that stuff. That's all background stuff. That's all Bible dictionary stuff. That's all commentary stuff that you don't get by simply reading the text in English because we don't live 3,200 years ago. So I had to learn all that stuff from doing some background work. That's the importance of doing the background work. That's the, the sweat that you and I have to do in order to prepare a good sermon if we're going to use Old Testament narrative. That's a skill that is going to take time and it's going to take some sweat. But it's essential. Any questions about Old Testament narrative? There's color in the Old Testament. How much of your Bible is Old Testament? Just out of statistical curiosity. Yeah, it's about 70%. Yeah, so 70%, you could argue that even if you mm, increased New Testament sermons to 50%, I would suggest that our preaching should be much, much, much more balanced between Old and New Testament. If I go into churches where I'm not speaking, it's almost invariable that the sermon text comes from a New Testament epistle. Well, they're important. I, I, I wouldn't downplay the importance of New Testament epistles one little bit. What I would encourage us to do is not allow us to leave out 70% of Scripture just because we call it old. It's there. It is just as much Scripture. Genesis 1 is just as much Scripture as Romans 1. It's there for us to preach. Get to know it well. Get to know stories well. Become a good storyteller. Last thing about stories, and then we're going to move into something a little bit different here. <clears throat> that is, you're going to have to take some risks when you tell, when you preach from Old Testament stories. You cannot be dry when you tell Old Testament stories. Can you imagine reading Little Red Riding Hood from a book in monotone? You can't do that. Or, or the three bears. 
Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Maybe, maybe I'm dating myself. I don't, know. I don't know. Maybe these are not your stories. or Any kind of kid story that you're telling. When you've got your grandkids on your knee, Peter, you're not sitting there saying, well, when I was a little boy, blah, 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 blah. And your kids, that's not how you tell stories. So don't tell Old Testament stories that way. Tell it with a little bit of, of, of mm, emotion because that's how the text was designed to be told. All of these stories were passed down from generation to generation orally initially. That's how we got this stuff. So get good at telling stories. And you know what? You're going to have to take some risks. Maybe you're not used to being a little bit excited behind the pulpit. Maybe you're used to just kind of being very factual. You can't do that with Old Testament narrative. You got to be a little bit emotional. You got to be a little bit risky. Maybe that's not your character. You got to you got to get some character. Because these are God's stories and they're not dry. If you do, here's the conclusion, all those things. If you do that work, if you take that risk, if you put the sweat into that. How many of you can remember the story of Ehud now. Ehud. Could you go home and with maybe a little bit of reference work back to, oh yeah, right, 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 get all of the details there. Could you go home and tell that story to somebody else? I would have to use heaven for that. <laughs> but you got the basics down, right? You will never forget Ehud. When I talk to my 31-year-old daughter, who now has two kids, and she's telling her kid's story, you know what her favorite Bible story is? Ehud. <laughs> How many Sunday school curricula have Ehud in the stories? Any of them? I don't know. I don't remember how old I was when I first heard this story. But this is, this, is, this is wonderful biblical history. And just from 10 minutes of telling a story the way the Bible was intended to be told, you will never forget that. That's how biblical Old Testament narrative was designed to be taught. So learn to teach it that way. Pretend like you're telling your grandkids a story. Because that's exactly what that is. And at the end of it, you don't have to spend a whole lot of time applying it because the application is embedded in the story. Slaughtering the fattened calf? I mean, goodness gracious. It's right there. Any questions? Comments, things you want to add? You'll never look at Ehud the same, will you? <laughs> All right. That's page four. Know the context, the background, and that's what your tools are for, is to help you develop that understanding of the, of the text, what's behind the text, the stuff that we miss out on unless we do that sweat. And then the story tells itself. Page six. Here's your assignment. Now, we got 20 minutes to work on it here together. What I want you to do for tomorrow morning, and, and we're all friends, we're all on this journey together, wanting to be better communicators of God's Word together. So what I'm going to ask you to do at the end of every session in preparation for the next session is to do a little bit of an assignment. And I'm going to call on some of you to help us out so that we can learn from each other and get better at this stuff. That's how we're going to get better. If I just talk for two hours every, more, every night and three hours every morning, that's not going to stick. If you guys put some sweat in between, that's going to stick a lot better. And then we'll help each other out at the beginning of each next session based on previous nights or previous morning session. Number seven here says, pick any Old Testament story and do background research on it. Now, what I mean by that is in B there. Get to know the characters, the main characters. You don't need to know all the characters. For example, the 12 sons of, of Jacob. You don't have to memorize all 12 of them. Excuse me. And the names of their, of, uh, the meanings of all their names. But when you get to um, Isaac, for example, 
you got to know what his name means if you're going to tell his story properly. Abraham. Why was his name Abram and now it's Abraham? Well, if you're going to tell his story, you got to know what his name means. So get to know the major characters, what the time period was like. Enoch lived in a different time period than Paul the Apostle did. It's just very, very different. And everything in between, get to know the context of the biblical story. And now you're talking a little bit more literarily, i.e. the stories just before, much more important than the stories coming after, but get to know the context. For example, when we were talking about Ehud just now, what was the story that was just before that? It was Othniel. Well, did you need to know anything about Othniel to understand Ehud? No. Did you need to know a little about, about the conquest of, of uh, Israel and what God told through Joshua the children of Israel not to do and to do at the end of Joshua in order to understand why they were in the mess they were in when Ehud came on the scene? Yeah, that was important. So we included that at the beginning of the story. So we got the global context of the story. So get to know the characters, get to know the story very well, and get to know the, the, uh, the time period, that, the, the uh, chronological context there. Last but not least, in C there under assignment, it says, are there any New Testament references to this character which help us to understand it? One of the best places to go for that frequently, as you know, is Hebrews chapter 11. So you'll get lots of evaluation of Abraham's faith in Hebrews chapter 11. You'll get a commentary on Moses' faith in Hebrews chapter 11. So that's one of the quick places to go. Sometimes Jesus talks about these characters. Sometimes they'll mention, David is mentioned multiple times in the New Testament. So when you're telling the story of, stories of David or Abraham or Moses, think about how, and you might have, that's part of the sweat, is look in your concordance, where does it talk about David in the New Testament? Where does it talk about, it? you get the idea. So if we're going to apply Old Testament narrative, often looking to what the New Testament says about that character is a good place to go. So I'll be, we're done at about 9 o'clock. We've got about 15 minutes. Pick an Old Testament story. You're welcome for this, uh, for this evening. I've got three of these, these dictionaries if you don't have one, and um, I'm happy to help. That is what, that's all the yakking that I'm going to do personally here tonight. Any questions before we sign off? Grand Prairie guys, anything that uh, you want to add or ask? All right, I'm going to turn off my microphone and... Uh,